So Hand Hygiene Australia are contacted um, nearly every day by sites asking for information on how to improve their programs and to get better results, how to take it to that next level. So we're frequently asked for information on what the best programs are doing. So we're going to try and cover some of that in this talk. In 2014, we started a program of site review visits with the aims being to identify innovations, to answer this question that everyone asks us every day. In 2014, we found that the successful programs had point of care product availability, hand hygiene included in all their educational activities, auditing in all areas of health service, visible auditors out there promoting the program, timely performance feedback, wards responsible for their own results, innovative interventions and promotions, active support from their hospital leadership, and there were rewards for outstanding performance. So that was back in 2014. From a further review of our data in 2017, we confirmed that the key effective components of hand hygiene programs were to have alcohol-based hand rub at the point of care, executive involvement, local ownership or champions, to have education involved in every aspect of hand hygiene, um, and to have auditing and, and um, feedback results. It became apparent that the sites stated that they had achieved this um, didn't always have the best results. So we decided to revisit our review processes to see whether we could um, search out what else is happening in the programs. So the objectives of this talk is really to, to present our updated version two of our review processes, to share common themes in our hand hygiene programs that we've visited, um, and to talk about some improvement strategies that are currently used by sites, and then to present ideas on how to go to that next level, to take it further, or to just challenge your thinking on what you're doing. So version two of our hospital review um, visits is very similar to our previous site review visits, except now that we actually ask all our questions before we come and visit you. So we give you our questions first and we go through all the answers back in the office before coming to visit. That means when we come to the site to actually visit, we get to talk about in more detail, more depth about what's going on in the program and really find out what you're doing rather than just having a quick answer on site because we've got so many questions to go through. So the common themes that we've found from our site review visits are our dedicated, each site has dedicated hand hygiene teams, have a structured audit process with many ward-based auditors, there's exceptionally detailed reporting, all levels of management are engaged in the hand hygiene reporting as well, which makes us, our programs sound like they're doing a fantastic job and that they're already at that next level. We've also found that the improvement strategies um, at sites or action plans that are in place are very similar across sites, and they can include having education, further data collection, they train more auditors, they report to more people, and they're asking for additional executive support. So these are common action plans to um, problems in data across the sites that we visit. But as you can see, our, our theme of, of this workshop is reflection and looking at our current practices. So we'll follow on from what uh, Sally has um, presented to as well. So I guess I want you to think about, have you ever heard of that saying, I can't see, you can't see the forest for all the trees? I think that we're losing sight of, of the hand hygiene behaviour change that the program is all about because we're fo so focused on data collection and on reporting. Because some of the other common themes that we're seeing at the sites that we visit um, is excessive data collection, too many auditors or no defined auditor role, frequent copious amounts of reports, minimal action plans or actions that are not actually actions, and limited implementation strategies. So I challenge you all to take a step back and after having 10 years of this national program, I think it's time to reflect on the purpose of each individual hand hygiene program. The first original objectives of the National Hand Hygiene Initiative were to accurately measure hand hygiene compliance. So initially we did bang on a lot about getting accurate data and collecting data in exactly the right way because we were trying to bring through all the states who were collecting in different ways all into this one national approach. So initially what, there was a big focus on data collection and the accuracy of that. But I think now what we want to move towards is our other objective was to make hand hygiene core business for all healthcare workers and institutions and the wider Australian community. We want to move on to that patient safety, move on to that behaviour change. So I'd like you to reflect throughout the talk on your existing hand hygiene programs and to focus on the following five areas of where improvements could be made. 
So we've broken them down to the, the key categories that we've seen when we've visited the sites of education, our auditors, data collection, reporting and executive engagement. So to start um, touching on education. All sites we've visited have reported um, providing education, but do you really provide hand hygiene education is the question I want you to ask yourself. In other words, do you give context to how, when and why hand hygiene should be performed? Hand Hygiene Australia provides basic online learning modules and basic concepts of hand hygiene, but it's really that clinical context for your particular site that's important for your education to change behaviour. We think that to go to the next level, we suggest that we need hand hygiene embedded in all activities. It shouldn't necessarily be a standalone topic on the five moments. Who's going to come to a, a, a um, in-service if you say it's all about the five moments? No one. Um, so we think it should be really built into all education. We know hand hygiene has been pulled out as a standalone program because the WHO have the evidence and the framework for us to work with hand hygiene as a standalone program. However, really it's part of everything you do. So staff need to be able to perform hand hygiene while concentrating on all other tasks that they do. It shouldn't just be something they think of on its own. The message needs to be simple. It's not just an online module to tick and flick like the data collection, but it needs to be an additional tool to use at specific times. But more importantly, education needs to be given the clinical context. We need to build that role of the educator to ensure hand hygiene is involved in all educational activities that we do. To look at our auditors and what we're finding with um, auditing. Um, so certainly an identifiable action for Hand Hygiene Australia is, is look, getting sites to look at their role of the auditors. Do you really know your auditors? We've reviewed many sites and as Sally said before there's many sites who have 200 plus auditors and when we visit them and say oh how, how are your auditors going well I don't actually know who they are and if you don't know who they are how can you manage them? Okay, um, And in not knowing who they are, often there's a blanket rule of everyone has to collect data every week because if they don't do it, they're not going to be part of the program. They're gonna, they're, we're going to lose our data collection that we need. So reflection is what helps us learn. And initially, as Sally said, it was the role of the ICP to run the hand hygiene program. And then as more roles get given to you over time, we've sort of spread that hand hygiene auditing out to our ward auditors. And that's fine because we need that engagement at ward level but really we need a combination of the two. We need to bring them together so they're working together. So you need to know your auditing team. You need to be able to rely on them to perform the role and to, and to know that they're collecting reliable and valid data. We suggest that they're given more direction on their role and dedicated time to perform it. Have, it, have ward auditors, but have a central team that collects data in each ward to verify the results. Use your auditors for more than just data collection. They should have a specific role that includes auditing, feedback, promotion, reporting, education, or a combination of those activities depending on the person. To look at data collection, to get you to reflect on the data collection that you do. Another common action plan in place is just to increase data collection. We have poor results, let's increase our data collection in our poor performing areas. However, do you already collect many more moments that you need? Do you know what your Hand Hygiene Australia requirements are for data collection? If you collect more data, as Sally said before, it's okay to collect more data as long as it's for a valid reason. So if you've got lots of wards at your facility and you want to get that 100 moments per ward as per the Hand Hygiene Australian guidelines, it makes sense that for some of you, you may, will submit more data because you've got more wards and what moments you have to submit. If you collect more data because there's an area of a focus for improvement, then that makes sense again. But just collecting more data for the sake of collecting more data doesn't really help you improve. If your hand hygiene compliance in your interim reports was low, collecting data won't fix it. And often we get told, I was told I had to. Who's telling you that you have to collect more data? Challenge the question of collecting more data. When we go back to the source in a number of hospitals, the source is quoted from an inaccurate source. So go back and challenge why you have to collect more data. 
So if auditors are collecting small amounts of data each week, what can that data tell you as well? If you've got all those ward auditors collecting 10 moments a week, does it actually tell you a story? What is the purpose of your data collection? Why are you collecting that data in the time that you do? So Hand Hygiene Australia would like you to reflect on your practices and we suggest collecting the minimum required amount of data only, unless you have valid reasons for additional data collection, as your data collection is just a measure of your improvement strategies. Okay, it's not the actual improvement strategy itself. You need to use your data to measure your improvement strategies and then you need to give time for change to occur before you measure again. So maybe block, going back to that blocks of auditing might be more helpful in showing improvement, in showing that what you're doing in, in the times between audits is making a difference. If you're using data as a monitoring process, then continuing data collection, continuous data collection may assist you. Okay, if it's just a monitoring process. But if you're looking at seeing if your improvement strategy is working, you might need to have a break of, da of data collection in between. So we challenge you to sit back and reflect on how and why you collect data. And are you doing so in a way that really shows your true compliance? We need to make sure that we are using our data to actually show improvements, to use it to to say, did we do a good job with that improvement strategy we put in place? So then looking at reporting, which flows on from that data collection, okay? Are you using your reports to quickly and easily identify trends and areas requiring action? Okay, we talk about a lot of people spending hours creating reports, really big reports. I've had to read through a few of them. They're really long, okay? And sometimes it's really hard to find that really one sentence that tells you exactly how you're going, okay? Make sure whatever reports you're showing easily show trends and easily show your results. Many sites have a lot of fancy automated systems in place for their reporting that it all gets sucked in and then spits out a report, which saves you a lot of time, but make sure that it comes out and shows the context of what you're doing with your data, how you're collecting it. Make sure that you can see the trends, make sure you can see the patterns of behaviour because that's what you want to use to focus your implementation of improvement strategies. Reports are often written and sent out to many executive committees, but who's actually seeing them? Okay, we get told that they're, they're reported on at 10 different committees. Who's actually looking at those results? Who's actually understanding them? Who's taking responsibility to address the trends? Who's responsible for creating the action plans? But more importantly, who is responsible for implementing and reviewing the success of the action plans? Do you follow a quality cycle when you're putting in, in, um, improvement strategies in place? Are you collecting data and reporting on that data is, is just one part of that quality cycle? Okay? Collecting data is not the improvement strategy itself. So, to go that next level, Hand Hygiene Australia is certainly challenging you to cut down on your reporting. If you do need to report monthly, because that's when your, your committees meet and that's you have to present something, because otherwise people forget about it, if we have to report something, then rather than just reporting on your numbers, on your figures, perhaps reporting on your action plans, reporting on where you're at with those action plans. What initiatives are you putting in place for the improvements? Remember that auditing exists as a way of measuring the success of your program. It's not the improvement strategy itself. So we need to shift our thinking from that collection of data to looking at it as a measurement of improvement. If you need to present at those monthly meetings, consider, as I said, report on your action plans and the results of those, not just data. Data should only really be discussed three times a year at those audit periods um, that you submit to Hand Hygiene Australia. And the last point is to look at executive engagement. All sites are quick to say that they have executive support and that they report to the executive and they report to the board and they report to the quality committee and the infection control committee and the data committee and whatever other committee you can think of, they're all reported. Everyone knows about it. So that ability to report those committees doesn't always mean that there's engagement. So I'd like to challenge that idea of what is executive engagement. When I look around the room and ask you what is your role at your facility, I'm sure many of you are going to tell me that you're the infection control staff member, maybe the only one, 
You also do staff health. You might be the immuniser, the hand hygiene lead, and you do that all in three days because you only work part time. So is that support to have all those roles and all those responsibilities um, in a short period of time? So engagement can be measured by who reviews the reports for executives, but it's really demonstrated by the executive team who are looking for trends in data. They're not just looking at a figure, did you meet that benchmark, did you not? They're looking for the trends overall. They're asking out, what are we doing about this? I can see that there's been a change in our medical staff. I can see there's been a change in our ED compliance rates. What are we doing about this? And it's those executive meetings where you are talking about the trends of data and the actions and improvement strategies where you actually have buy-in, where you have people engaged in what you are doing and what you're presenting. You could also say that true engagement could be measured by the amount of EFT provided for certain activities, whether that's for the hand hygiene auditing team or education and promotional events. That's putting value on the program. So really, I think um, after 10 years of the Hand Hygiene Australia program, and I know it's, I've been there 10 years, and I know Lindsay's presented on eight years data, but I'm about to get my 10-year badge at the Austin, so I've been there 10 years. I think it's now time that we hit that refresh button and review our practices. We don't want to just be going through the motions of data collection and tick and flick the hand hygiene. It's not one of those accreditation activities that you suddenly just do at the last minute because the accreditors are coming. Um, we want to change hand hygiene behaviour. That is our aim of our program. So Hand Hygiene Australia suggests that everyone considers the following when you go back to work, when you go back and look at your hand hygiene program. So we want you to challenge the role of auditors. Having a lot of auditors can be great, it certainly can embed that peer-to-peer -peer feedback of one-on-one -on, -one on the wards, but is that what your auditors are doing, or are they just collecting 10 moments a week and putting it away? We want you to transform how you see the auditing. It's not just something that you have to tick the box and say, my audits are done, I've met the requirements, but we want you to use your auditing as a way of measuring your, your improvement strategies. Have you made a difference? We want you to really move towards that improvement model. We want you to focus um, change the focus of your education, perhaps. Make sure that it's really simple messaging. You'll notice a lot of the hand hygiene online modules have really taken out the five moments terminology as such, and we really just try and talk about before and after, before and after touching a patient, before and after a procedure. Try and change that focus of education to a clinical context. Do short in-services on a particular procedure. Build hand hygiene into everything you do, not just see it as a standalone activity. And invest in your interventions, not just your data collection. Rather than having 200 auditors collecting some moments, have 200 people out there educating um, staff as they're auditing. Have 200 people promoting the program. So we hope that all hand hygiene programs can get back to following the, the key components of the WHO multimodal culture change strategy that are imperative for changing and improving hand hygiene behaviour, because this is what it's all about. Thank you.